year. Um, I wanna, um, just wanted to give you a sense of where I come from in this discussion. Uh, I started out as working for an NGO um, now many years ago in Uganda uh, during the conflict in northern Uganda um, and was doing education programs and psychoeducation programs there. And I started to um, wonder as I was doing the work, how is this, how do we know here whether our work is effective at all? How do, how do we know if what we're doing makes a difference? And um, so then I went on to do research and figure out how to ask those questions and use methods to, to answer those questions. And so I started doing research with NGOs and doing evaluations. And I was kind of on that route and then was also wondering, well, how do we know that the research we're doing actually makes a difference and feeds back into, um, into practice? And so now I sit in this bridging position as the director of research and evaluation in an NGO and, and kind of do a bit of both um, to, and to try to do some of this translation um, in between research and practice. Um, so that's the lens that I come to uh, come to this with. Um, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit today is just the use of evidence um, in IRC. Really, um, not using this as use, using this as an example um, of an NGO, and, and just tell you a little bit about our journey um, as we've tried to become a, an evidence-based organization and really use evidence um, and to think about how. Um, to go from using it on an individual basis or looking at one study and trying to have um, you know, the next practitioner use evidence to actually thinking about it as a system in the organization. How do we, uh, as an organization, actually become evidence-based and what does that, that look like? Um, so there's been a lot written recently um, about the use of evidence and barriers and facilitators for the use of evidence. There was actually, a couple of weeks ago, a really great blog uh, by Dave Evans on development impact in the World Bank, uh, the World Bank blog. Um, you probably can't see it here, but um, that's the link to the blog, but it, um, development impact. And he does a really nice summary of a panel, but also some of the literature that's been done and summarized a systematic review, actually, that looked at uh, the evidence of, or, or different papers that have actually looked at what barriers and facilitators are for the use of evidence. And so here's a list, the, the actually his summary on the blog of the barriers. Um, the top is actually the barriers, but the flip side is the facilitators. So the availability and access of research um, uh, can often be a barrier or a facilitator. The clarity, relevance, reliability of that research uh, and those findings, um, people, a barrier is people don't have time, policymakers, practitioners don't have time to actually read the research. Uh, in the way that it's given, um, that often policymakers don't have research skills or the skills to interpret uh, the research, and then the cost of, of doing so. And then a key facilitator that wasn't listed as one of the barriers, um, but that seems really important, is that, that people um, named, uh, and this is again across many different studies and, and is perception based, but um, that relationships and collaboration with both policymakers and researchers was, was really key. Um, so this is just a, a, a summary of a lot of the literature that's out there, and, and now I'll tell more uh, the IRC story and, and how, and, and some of it certainly reflects um, some of this work. But to give you a sense, the International Rescue Committee is an organization, an NGO that works um, across 35 countries, and uh, including uh, resettling refugees in the U.S. Um, we work in uh, conflict and disaster affected. Uh, contexts, um, both from emergency through uh, post-conflict development. Um, we're, uh, as you can see, mostly in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, or the majority of our Sub-Saharan Africa and Middle East, you can see there's a huge gap in Latin America, so we are not, uh, we have been in the past in Latin America, but currently are not. Um, and then just to give you a quick sense of the scope of what we do, so we're also across a lot of different sectors. So um, water and sanitation, health, um, gender-based violence, education, so we, and, and a few others, but um, really work across different, uh, different sectors. So what we started out um, when, about 10 years ago, we really started thinking about how do we push being more evidence-based, also contributing to the evidence itself, but how do we come, become more evidence-based as an organization? We really started kind of one person at a time. And, but for a global organization of now um, 
around 12,000 staff, it's, it's impossible to become evidence-based doing it one person at a time. Um, so, and, and I'd say we've, we've made a lot of headway over the years in thinking about how do you influence key adopters, who are the people that are ready um, to use evidence, how do you build these relationships and, and try to influence them. But we're now at a place, given the size of our organization, but also um, that we've, we've kind of come along this pathway in, in thinking about how do we, again, more systemically uh, become evidence-based. And, and some of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of doing that, and I'll, I'll tell some of our progress and also where we think we're, um, where we're trying to head, is really how do we create a vision um, that includes being evidence-based? How do we create, a, create and communicate a vision uh, about being evidence-based? How do we create, um, continue to create a powerful coalition, people within the organization that want to push uh, forward and be more evidence-based? Um, how do we remove obstacles that are actually getting in the way of using evidence? And then how do we um, think about short-term wins to actually show that this is a positive thing? Um, and so first, in terms of creating the vision, what was, uh, what's been really important for us is this, this vision is not about the use of evidence. That, that, the, that's not the vision. The vision is actually the, this broader vision of creating greater impact, um, that this is that our, of course, mission as an organization, as an NGO, um, is about having greater impact on the lives of the people that we serve. Um, and, and so that's kind of a, the broadest sense, the, the vision that we have, um, and, and thinking about how does evidence then fit into that vision um, as a piece of having greater impact. And what became important for us, and it seems extremely obvious, um, particularly to researchers, but is to have really well-defined outcomes as an organization. Um, and that was something that we didn't have. There, all of our projects had um, outcomes uh, defined, but as an organization, we didn't have well-defined measurable outcomes. So we've spent the last while thinking about more specifically than this, but these are our broad ranging, uh, the five outcomes that we work on, health, economic well-being, safety, education, and power. Um, so those are the, the five outcomes that we've defined as an organization, and then um, I'll show a little bit later that those are further uh, defined. And so using evidence, again, became part of how do we have this greater impact. Um, and then thinking about, and each organization has its own um, way and, and the importance of what the, the messages are and how to portray those messages for us. Um, what became evident is that we couldn't just talk about the use of evidence on its own as creating that greater impact, that that was actually getting in the way of um, having people come on board to using evidence. Um, because they were hearing the message, even though this wasn't, we didn't think this is what we were saying, and we being the research team and then those allies that kind of came on board, they heard evidence is the most important or the only way um, to have greater impact. That's what they heard us saying, which is not actually what we were saying. But um, So it became really important that our messaging was always about evidence and. And so evidence is a critical factor to use. Research, you have to know the research, you need to use evidence. Um, but it also is critical uh, to use a, um, knowledge, information about the context and translate the evidence um, for that context and that client voice, client desires, client demands um, also need to be weighed against that evidence. And so as we talked about evidence, we almost never now say we should use evidence. We say we should use evidence, we should use be informed by context, we should be, ensure that we're listening to clients. And that helps the message, um, which again is something that we always intended, but we've become much more explicit about that. Um, so then in terms of um, creating a powerful coalition, um, those of you in uh, in the government or in, in advocacy will know this much better than I do, but um, you know it's really important in terms of the, the influencers within the organization. What has now taken us from um, the research team really pushing this evidence from the side and the use of evidence from the side to now a central part of our organizational strategy is that we got a new CEO and president uh, less than two years ago um, who um, I would say it was both work and luck um, 
work and that we tried to influence very early in the strategy. We, we were very involved in the strategy development. Um, but also he came to the, he already came with a bent towards being evidence-based. And so um, it was lucky for us in the sense that he already had that um, and had from previous positions um, been using evidence. And so he became a powerful um, voice, obviously, and, and leader for us in terms of pushing the agenda forward and having this become much more central uh, for the organization. Um, but, but it isn't, of course, just the CEO or president, it's also who the key influences are, who the opinion leaders are in the organization and trying to think about who those uh, influencers are. And we're trying to do that uh, even more now as we're rolling this out. Um, and I'd say we've been successful um, in, in early adopters and sometimes less successful in those who are sort of loudly um, opposing um, or who are sitting on the fence and, and we've more recently tried to engage very actively and openly on the various nuanced debates about evidence including this um, the kind of mix of evidence context clients which is more important and just try to be really open about those debates and that's actually brought people uh, further along as well um, so removing obstacles this is where I'll talk a little bit more in depth um, we, uh, and this goes back to that initial review um, of what many people are finding, uh, found that certainly this um, obstacle to making research relevant uh, and available was one that those decision makers, those who are designing programs in the field and countries, um, did not have access to uh, research. And if they did have access to it, um, they, they were, um, it, was, it was not in an actionable format. And so breaking this down, we really thought, what we need to help do is to identify and organize uh, in a thoughtful way the available evidence, that we, the relevant evidence, um, that we need to identify what's actionable about that evidence, um, and that we uh, need to present this in an uh, actionable evidence in a way uh, that, is, uh, that, that decision makers can um, access it and, and digest it quickly. Um, so here's what we've been doing. Um, so for each of the, uh, I'm not sure if there's a pointer. For each of the um, outcomes, our organizational outcomes, we've been breaking them down further into uh, what those, what the sub outcomes are. Essentially defining the, the outcomes further, um, and then defining what the, as far as we know from the evidence, what the causal pathways are to reaching those outcomes. Um, so to give you a closer up picture, one of the sub-outcomes for health is that women are healthier, um, that they're protected from unintended pregnancy, um, protected from and treated for complications of pregnancy and childbirth, um, from uh, sexual transmitted infection, and from uh, consequences of gender-based violence. Um, and again, this is just one section of, of health. Um, further defining these, how we would measure them, but then also, as you can see, uh, there are color codes here. And what we've been doing is doing systematic searches of the literature to look at what interventions are shown to be, uh, to have evidence to support these outcomes. Um, and in a fairly broad way, then defining these in, um, color coding them in, here are the interventions for this outcome that you should stop, because there's strong evidence to support that they are not effective. Uh, here are the ones that we should study, because uh, they don't have enough evidence yet, but could, could be promising. And then here are the, the interventions that have enough evidence at this stage, and we should be just trying to go to scale. Um, so I won't go through all of this, but what that meant is that we developed a, a levels of evidence to say um, where there's systematic review, really good, uh, rigorous evidence that there's negative or no impact, we should stop those. Um, these levels just say there's some evidence uh, from monitoring up to one impact evaluation, um, and so we should continue to study these. And here, four through six are where we have really strong evidence to impact evaluations um, or a systematic review saying that this has positive um, impact. Now, the, this still this is at the sort of broadest level. Um, what's of course still important is this this gives a broad picture, but it doesn't say in a particular context. So in each of these levels, this says demonstrates a meaningful positive impact in settings applicable to the project context. Um, be, so the decision still has to be made in this particular area with this particular population, uh, does this intervention actually matter? But this gives uh, a first overview of what the evidence says and then practitioners need to make a decision themselves, is this applicable to this context? 
Um, and then, so back to this, so then what we're doing now is turning this into an interactive um, website essentially where practitioners will be able to click on the outcome, say this is the, the outcome that we're looking for, and then here are, is a list of the interventions that have been studied. Um, here's a summary in actionable format, as much as we can do that, of the evidence. Um, and then they still, of course, have to translate that. Does this make sense in this context? Um, what does that um, look like What are the, in terms of client demand? Um, but the evidence is available, at, will be available at their fingertips um, in a more actionable format than has been before. And this is something we're going to share um, broadly externally as well as internally. Um, and then doing a lot of testing of it. I mean, this will be a beta version to then say, does this actually work? Are people, people using it? Um, so, of course, we know that uh, the only obstacles, the only obstacles to, um, to the use of evidence are not just information. Uh, so we um, are doing all this work because we think that's a core piece of it, but we're also really thinking about the incentives within the organization to use evidence. Um, we're a fairly donor-driven organization, so um, there are some donors who do reward uh, the use of evidence, but very few. That's not what's generally rewarded in terms of funders. Um, so right now, we're, we're trying to think with our key leaders, the CEO and other um, senior leaders who have bought in, how do we think about people's jobs um, and technical advisors, part of their job being about knowing the evidence and using that in program and intervention design. How, in their performance reviews, is that a part of what's reviewed? Um, because we think if the incentives internally aren't aligned to um, the vision as an organization to use evidence, then um, then you know it's not actually going to take form, take place, even if we've got the information available for them. Um, the other is around norms, and part of this has started to shift. But to think about as a professional in a humanitarian organization um, who has 10, 15 years of experience, um, you the norm should also be that you know the, the research, not that you're a researcher, not that you understand all the methods, but that you have a sense and, and know how to find um, the information on, on research and are, are uh, up to date on that and changing that professional norm. Um, and lastly, uh, creating quick wins. And this, I think we haven't really thought enough about this to how to help those who are actually starting to use evidence and think about it. What are the wins for them uh, that's gonna make this uh, more uh, promising and take hold? Um, recently, we had, as one example, as we've been thinking about this, um, some discussions with uh, country teams. We actually talked through the different tools that we were designing um, the indicators, program guidance, summaries of evidence, and said which would be most, which are most important to you, which do you think you would use the most, and had them rank those, and then also asked them uh, what else would you want. Um, and they came up with, well, what we actually, one of the things we need that you haven't talked about at all is talking points for our donors. If we're actually going to try to influence donors to fund more evidence based programs, given that they dictate a lot of what we have to we, we do. Uh, we need talking points to influence them, and that was just something that we hadn't talked about, but it's a pretty easy thing for us to develop um, and do, and so that's something we're going to do immediately just to, again, give them, in a, a sense, listen to the demand and not just come from a, a pretty supply driven place. Um, so that's it. I'll end there um, with uh, this vision. Thanks. Mm -hmm.